Sydney, 1929, King's Cross. A group of men trolled down the once reviled Kellett Street, home to, at the time, a row of run-down hovels, dingy houses, and homes that doubled as a place where men could go to illegally purchase booze after the clock struck six. The men, armed with razors, bottles, rocks, shoes, and fists, were acting upon orders of retaliation. Just a few weeks prior, their gang had been attacked by rivals, and Kellett Street was about to play center stage to what would become known as the Razor Gang Wars. And tension had never been higher between their two feuding underworld queens, Kate Lee and Tilly Devine. Welcome back to a new series here on Shadow Matter. In this series, we're going to be exploring some of the most fascinating stories of Sydney's criminal underworld and their most infamous characters. Today's episode, we'll be delving into the life and crimes of Sydney's crime queens and the razor gangs that they controlled during the 1920s and 30s. This has been a very popular request on my channel, so I do hope you enjoy. Without further ado, let's explore. During the outbreak of World War I, Australian and New Zealand forces were joined together to fight for the Allies in the Mediterranean and Middle East, known collectively as ANZAC, which stands for Australian New Zealand Army Corps. Before and after being deployed, they were stationed in Great Britain. For many young servicemen, it was a known pastime to visit the red light districts of their local deployments, many of whom who had not seen a woman for quite some time. The working girls of London openly welcomed these foreign suntanned men from Australia, for they were known to be better paid than their English counterparts, which became a lucrative market for the working girls. As with many Anzac soldiers, they found their respective wives overseas, and many of these brides migrated to Australia to live with their returned servicemen husbands. As was the case for the infamous Tilly Devine. Tilly was born Matilda Mary Twiss on the 8th of September 1900 in South London. Her upbringing was anything but luxurious, having been raised in poverty and being acclimatized to the crime that surrounded her childhood. She left school aged 12 and began to work in one of the area's many factories. This was short-lived, and Tilly was determined to move on from her impoverished life. She soon became a prostitute, frequenting the area of West End for more wealthier clients. Some sources state that she was only 13 or 14 when she began work as a streetwalker. At age 16, she met and married Australian serviceman James Big Jim Devine. The couple had one son, Frederick, born in London. Tilly continued to work as a prostitute during her marriage to Jim Devine, and from 1915 to 1919, she had been arrested and locked up numerous times for soliciting, theft, and assault. Tilly and Jim's marriage was far from the romantic ideals of a wartime sweetheart's, but rather a more explosive one and fought with altercations, both physical and verbal. But still as violent as their relationship was, when Jim returned to Australia in 1919, Tilly chose to follow him on what was known as the Warbright ship, the Waimana. Tilly hoping to escape the poverty of the slums of London and traded for the land of opportunity and sunshine, followed her husband only to find that she had traded one life of squalor for another. The couple rented a flat in Glenmore Paddington, which was then a rundown slum area of overcrowded and poorly constructed dwellings. The inner eastern suburbs were also home to a notorious and violent underworld, where drug peddlers, sly grog sellers, razor gangs, and brothels were just a normal part of everyday life. Tilly and Jim were about to fit right in. An upsurge of crime began to develop in Sydney during the early half of the 20th century, mostly due to a few laws being passed, and criminals saw a gap in these markets that they could exploit. A few of these we have already discussed in a previous episode, so for pacing and the purposes of this video, we will give a brief overview of some of these laws that ultimately led to the violent wave of crimes in the 1920s and 30s. The first was an attempt to moralize or clean up the streets of Sydney by introducing the Vagrancy Act in 1902, which made it easier for police to arrest a woman if deemed to be a common prostitute. This was strengthened by an amendment in 1908 by the Police Offences Act, which also prohibited any man from living off the earnings of a prostitute. 
The second was the prohibition of the sale of cocaine, which used to be readily available at chemists or doctors in 1925. In addition to this was the Temporary Licensing Act, passed in 1916, which restricted the sale of alcohol to certain hours, making it illegal to purchase after 6 p.m. These acts passed coincidentally provided criminals with an avenue to exploit a gap in these markets. Sly grog was a term used to indicate the illegal sale of alcohol after the pubs shut at 6 p.m. Many punters still feeling thirsty, and criminals were only too happy to provide the liquor. They would set up in houses known as sly grog shops, where people could continue to buy their liquor after 6 o'clock. Sometimes, these sly grog houses also doubled as brothels, and if you felt the need, maybe a bump of cocaine for the walk home. This endeavor made it extremely profitable for members of Sydney's criminal underworld. Every crook in the city was looking to get their cut of the action. Naturally, this would lead to violence amongst many of Sydney's gangs, which would lead to the New South Wales government imposing severe penalties for any persons carrying concealed firearms and pistols. And this is how these gangs adopted shaving razors as their preferred weapon of choice, giving birth to the now infamous Razor Gangs. Kate Lee was one of Sydney's most notorious criminals. She rose to prominence during the 1910s and 1920s, taking advantage of the Temporary Licensing Act and the crackdown on street prostitutes by opening up her own string of sly grog shops and brothels. At the height of her career, Kate ran more than 20 sly grog houses. Some of these she kept to a high standard to attract a more lucrative clientele, often said to be frequented by businessmen, politicians, and some sources even state that police were also known to visit. Lee was born in Dubbo, New South Wales, on the 10th of March, 1881, to a family of eight children and Roman Catholic parents. During her childhood, she suffered from neglect and spent many years at a girl's home. She also had an out-of-wedlock pregnancy and gave birth to daughter Eileen May in 1900. In 1902, she married Chinese-Australian James Ernest Jack Lee, who was an illegal bookmaker and petty criminal. Kate was forever known by her anglicized version of her husband's last name, even after they separated in 1905, when Jack Lee was imprisoned for assault and robbery. The marriage broke up shortly after the trial. During the 1910s, Kate Lee had begun a relationship with Samuel Dewey Freeman, an armed robber who was supposedly the first criminal in Australia to use a getaway car. It was through this relationship that brought Kate into contact with Sydney's wider criminal underworld. It wasn't until 1915 when she received her first serious prison sentence for perjury. According to sources, she was accused of lying under oath to protect her lover by giving him an alibi to a conviction of armed robbery. At this time, Lee only had minor offenses on her record, mostly for prostitution. By the time of her release in 1919, Kate Lee returned to a city that had undergone a massive social change. After a riot had broken out containing 5,000 drunk Anzac servicemen, the Premier of New South Wales adopted the Temporary Licensing Act in 1916. Pubs and hotels were now required to close at 6 p.m. But for advantageous criminals like Lee, this became a great financial opportunity. For the next few decades, Kate Lee had established a criminal empire of sly grog houses, brothels, illegal gambling, drug dealing, and stolen property. Her houses of ill repute became widely known throughout Sydney, not only through criminals, but the wealthy upper class also. Some of her premises exuded luxury, and it wasn't uncommon to see a gentleman, a politician, or businessman frequent her many establishments. Adored by her fellow criminals and customers alike, her sly grog operations in brothels gained a nickname, Mums. Using her wealth and power, she amassed a gang of violent criminals that held her in the highest regard and more importantly, they were loyal, often using these violent crooks as standover men and thieves to do most of the heavy lifting within her illicit empire, although it is said she was quite adept at using a rifle herself. It is said during her heyday, she was known to be one of the wealthiest women in Sydney, amassing a substantial amount of money through her ill-gotten gains. Kate was quite fond of expensive fur coats and fine jewelry, perhaps giving to the genesis of her titles the Queen of Surrey Hills, also known as the Queen of the Underworld. By 1925, Tilly Devine had become quite well known to the police. In just five years of her arrival on Australian soil, she had accumulated a rather long list of convictions. 
initially working the streets as a prostitute, while her husband, Big Jim, provided her with protection, for which she received more than a few convictions for, along with other minor offenses. It was in 1925 that saw her serving two years at a state reformatory for maliciously wounding Sidney Cork, a confectioner with a razor blade. The police report depicts her in a rather unflattering light, describing her as a prostitute of the worst type and an associate of vagrants and criminals. However, in prison, she was known as Pretty Tilly. It was inside prison that Tilly had a change of plans to her criminal career. Looks don't last forever, and Tilly was determined to become a successful businesswoman. In fact, Tilly and her soon-to-be rival, Kate Lee, had the same idea to exploit a loophole in the New South Wales Police Offences Act that made it illegal for men to operate a brothel, act as a pimp, or profit from the earnings of prostitution. This law did not extend to women. It was with this loophole that Tilly made the conscious decision to become a madam. After her release from prison, she began to buy up property from her illicit activities and turn them into a string of brothels throughout the Darlinghurst, Paddington, and Woolloomooloo areas in Sydney. To guard her illegal empire, Tilly employed a large staff of standover men, bouncers, and bodyguards to protect both her premises and the women working in them. Also in her employ were prostitutes of every age and background. Her husband, Big Jim, helped move cocaine and sly grog. The design of their business was Tilly to be the face of the business, conducting transactions and organizing the prostitutes, while Jim sold them cocaine. Part of this was done to ensure loyalty and dependence on their jobs with the divines. If they got hooked enough, which was generally the case, it meant that the girls would increasingly accept cocaine as payment rather than taking a cut of the cash. Quite quickly, Tilly Divine had garnered quite a substantial amount of wealth thanks to her and her husband's criminal operations and her own franchise of brothels and sly grog shops. Eventually moving out of Woolloomooloo to Maroubra, an upper middle class suburb of Sydney, the Divines would throw wild parties, much to the upset and frustration of their conservative neighbours. Tilly was finally in her own right, moving up in the world, and she was gaining a lot of attention. The Queen of Surrey Hills, Kate Lee, was just another person keeping a close eye on her new competitor. According to most sources, the razor gangs and pushers of Sydney had always been using blades and razors as weapons, but it wasn't until 1927 when the Pistol Licensing Act was passed. According to legend, a visiting sailor used a cutthroat razor to defend himself from attackers, and as a result, razors became a weapon of choice amongst the gangsters of Sydney. Due to its ease of concealment and affordable price from barbershops, the gangs began to use it more increasingly, and the men involved with these violent attacks would often be left disfigured with scars that they wore as a badge of pride. There were many gangs and pushes operating during the late 1920s in Sydney, many more notorious figures of the city's underworld. But for the purposes of this video, we will only be briefly mentioning a few and saving the rest for future episodes. The main players at this stage were Norman Brunn and Nellie Cameron, a dangerous duo in their own right. Phil the Jew Jeffs, who would go on to own many of Sydney's illicit nightclubs, including the notorious 50-50 Club. George Gaffney, a standover man for Lee, and a main rival for Big Jim Devine. Kate Lee, and the Queen of Woolloomooloo herself, Tilly Devine. For a certain time, there was peace and understanding amongst these gangs. No one encroached upon another's territory, and they kept relatively to themselves. This situation was, however, about to change for the worst. During the late 1920s, Kate Lee and Tilly Devine had been feuding for a number of years. Some sources indicate they even fought openly in public. Tilly Devine had even publicly denounced her underworld rival as a dope pusher and a white slaver. However many interactions, violent or otherwise, their rivalry came to a bloody head in 1929. Gang violence had been increasing in the past year, with the deaths of prominent underworld figures like Norman Brunn, and a 30-minute brawl in King's Cross known today as the Battle of Blood Alley involving Phil Jeffs. But it was the ambush of Frank Green and Sid MacDonald, two of Tilly's standover men in Woolloomooloo, that ultimately brought the two queens of the underworld into another level of violent conflict. Green and MacDonald were ambushed by Kate's men, mainly involving George Gaffney and a few others. The two men then made their way to the Divine's Maroubra home to hide out. Expecting another attack, the men, now with Jim Devine, armed themselves with pistols. When Gaffney did show up, Jim shot him. Before he died of his wounds, 
Gaffney refused to testify in court against Jim, and Devine was found not guilty of the attack. With Tilly now on the offensive, she ordered her men to attack Lee's string of sly grog shops in Kellett Street. Lee was incarcerated at the time. Men from both sides attacked each other with razors, fists, boots, bottles, rocks, and whatever else was handy. The 40 or 50 strong riot occurred on the 8th of August, 1929, and today is remembered as one of the catalysts to the government introducing a new amendment to the Vagrancy Act, allowing police more power to arrest anyone, male or female, in connection or profiting from prostitutes. Tilly and Kate were raided and arrested many more times after this, and still would fight each other for many more years to come. It wouldn't be until 1936 when Police Commissioner William Mackay insisted they cease fire and both women agreed to an uneasy truce. Two of Sydney's wealthiest women were allowed to continue their operations without police interference if they promised to stop attacking each other. An annoying yet sensible compromise. The Depression era of the 1930s hit both women fairly hard. Add to that numerous raids and convictions. It's easy to see why Devine and Lee both agreed to a truce under the police commissioner's request. Both madams were quite fond of fancy dress, fine jewelry, and expensive cars. Their courthouse appearances had become a public arena for entertainment, and the press loved to write about them. Lee and Devine, both managing to hold on to their criminal empires during the 30s, saw their businesses boom once more, and it was all thanks to the Second World War. American soldiers stationed in Australia during the Pacific Theatre era would frequent many of the brothels owned by the queens of Sydney's underworld. This boom was however fraught with its own personal traumas. Tilly divorced Jim in 1943, after 25 years of abusive marriage. On one occasion, he shot at her, thankfully only destroying her stilettos. The war also brought out the women's more benevolent sides, often throwing parties at their own expense and donating the proceeds to Australian soldiers' families. As the years passed, the once queens of the underworld began to slowly lose their power and their empires. In 1955, Tilly Devine was ordered to pay £20,000 in unpaid tax to the Australian government. In order to make those payments, she was forced to sell all but one of her establishments. Just a year earlier, her longtime rival, Kate Lee, had declared bankruptcy for failing to pay some £6,000 in arrears of taxes. Continuing to live in Surrey Hills, she died on the 4th of February, 1964. Much of the press at the time, ignoring her underworld crimes, treated her as a kindly provider of a depression era and painted her as a wartime patriot. Tilly Devine, left with her one establishment on Palmer Street, suffered another blow when it was firebombed in 1968 by new criminal entrepreneurs seeking to monopolize the prostitution industry in East Sydney. Tilly died of cancer in 1970, after suffering for 20 years with bronchitis. In contrast to her contemporary, Tilly was given a scathing obituary that depicted her as a vicious, grasping high priestess of savagery, obscenity, and whoredom. There was no wake at Tilly's funeral. Once one of Sydney's most ruthless and wealthiest madams, Tilly Devine died in poverty and pain. Since their deaths, both women had become legendary folk characters of Sydney's criminal history. Countless books, podcasts, TV shows, documentaries, and yes, even YouTube videos have been made about them, forever immortalizing their deeds and misdeeds in Australian history. This has been an episode of Sydney's Criminal Underworld here on Shadow Matter. Stay tuned to see more episodes on the saga coming soon. And if you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and hit subscribe if you want to see more content like this and hit that notification bell to keep up to date with the latest videos. And together, we can explore the strange, the terrifying, the unknown, the shadow matter.